Hey everyone, this is Eddie Kalegi with Tim Moore reminding you that Sportspeak is now powered by SeatGeek. SeatGeek is the one-stop shop for tickets to sporting events, concerts, and so much more. Use the promo code SPORTSPEAK at checkout for $20 off your first purchase. SeatGeek, let there be live. Now, on to the show. Hey everybody, how is it going? Happy Draft Week and welcome to episode 171 of Sportspeak Live powered by SeatGeek. Use promo code SPORTSPEAK, all caps, one word for $20 off your first purchase at checkout. I'm Eddie Kalegi. And I'm Tim Moore. This is going to be a fun episode because again, NFL Draft 2024, it is this Thursday and we're going to be previewing it here on this episode. In addition to Tim and I, we got a couple of great guests. Uh, he covers a lot with the draft. He does some mock drafts himself from the DMV, Ethan Hoffman joining us and also the coach, Brett Hahn, to break things all down. So let's start with the quarterbacks, which are obviously the conversation here. Caleb Williams most people believe will be the number one overall draft pick. And I'll start it with this and Tim, I'll go to you first. This quarterback draft class reminds me a lot of what we saw three years ago when Trevor Lawrence was the undisputed number one. A lot of people were hyping him up as this generational prospect. And while I think Caleb Williams will be good, I think like Trevor Lawrence, he's a bit overrated. I think he's going to be good. I don't know if he's going to be great. I think there's some worrying signs there. And then the rest of the QB class, is a lot of question marks, which we saw with that group with Zach Wilson and Trey Lance and Justin Fields and Mac Jones for one reason or another. And I think there's similar questions with Jaden Daniels and with JJ McCarthy, obviously, who for some reason just keeps soaring up the draft boards. So Tim, what do you make of the current quarterback class? Yeah, I, I consider it to be absolute anarchy, but I really think the only reason why we're seeing a lot of quarterbacks spiral up or spiral downward is because of the fact that Based on injuries last year and what we're seeing in the NFL, there are just so many teams that need a quarterback or need an immediate answer that, again, in every draft we talk about it, but this draft in particular where you kind of have an idea, but you're not sure, and there's a lot of decent prospects, everybody is going to have an urgency to go pick one. And while I would say in the quarterback sense of the room of what you're seeing, right, Caleb Williams, yes, on paper, is the best quarterback, but to me... I, I still don't understand the hype on J.J. McCarthy. I really don't get it. The stats, and again, you know how big I am about stats. The stats don't add to me as somebody who is a top five caliber quarterback. And to be honest with you, not to go further down the board, I know a lot of people were if you were Penix will go rather would be first round, second round. But, and yes, he has a very good or had a very good receiver where he was in Washington. But my thing is that to me, when you look at stats and other things driven again, I know, it's a little bit different depending on what conference you play in and so on. But to me, he looks to be the more battle tested and ready quarterback of the other two that you could compare of outside of Caleb Williams, of course. So to me, I, I don't know. It's very interesting to say, but I, I think there's definitely going to be a lot of overhyping. And to be truthfully honest with you, I really feel the wide receiver class is what really makes this draft more than anything else because. Marvin Harrison Jr. is I what I truthfully believe he's going to be a Hall of Famer. He's going to be just like his father, if not even better. And I think he's a physical receiver that can do a lot of special things. Blake Neighbors is very good at taking the tops off of defenses. And, I mean, when you even look at the top three, I would say there is, I mean, just a lot of options for teams that, Listen, if you may not have that quarterback, for example, like I mentioned, the Giants, um, where it's a little bit iffy, right? A lot of people want to see him draft a quarterback. A lot of people want to see him draft a receiver. I personally want to see him draft the neighbors. But you can kind of start fixing or building a team here in the top 10 based on the talents that you have at wide receiver. So I'm interested to see what happens. But I definitely think the quarterback class, to be honest with you, a little bit overhyped. Yeah, that's what I think, too. Yet. Ethan, in your mock draft, I know there's teams that have needs at quarterback, but you have four QBs going in the top five. And the biggest surprise to me is number two overall, you have the commanders taking J.J. McCarthy over Jaden Daniels and Drake May. So what's the thought process on that? Well, now when I do the mocks, I try to be as predictive as possible. I don't like putting my own opinion. In my opinion, I don't see much special with McCarthy. I feel like he was... 
an average player on a really good team. Um, but it sounds like the commanders really like him. Uh, they had a meeting with Daniels a couple of days ago, and they said it ended badly where uh, Daniels camp doesn't want to go there. Washington probably moved on. They could take uh, Drake May, but I think with that staff, they could see more upside in McCarthy with that system than they would it with May. So opinions wise, who do you think is the next best quarterback behind Caleb Williams? I think it's got to be May. Like, <sighs> It's always been Williams and May for the past three years, ever since May debuted for UNC and Williams played for Oklahoma. It's been those two. I feel like May is kind of getting some prospect fatigue where people are tapering off of him. He reminds me a lot of Justin Herbert. If you remember in his class, he was really, really high. People loved him. And then later on, he kind of started to dip. You know, Burrow had that big year. Tua, he was always kind of behind Tua in that hype. Some people were having Jordan Love over him. Jalen Hurts was over him. He kind of reminds me of that, even play style-wise. I feel like they have a very similar play style, strong arm quarterback. Um, I think he's behind Caleb, second best quarterback. Brett, I want to let you weigh in on this uh, quarterback discussion here. For me, Drake May, as I've said on this show before, I think he's better than what who I'm about to compare him to, but all the signs just remind me a lot of Daniel Jones, a guy that was underrated coming out of the ACC that a lot of people didn't really know that much about. And there's going to be scrutiny if he gets picked early in the draft. There is going to be from different people. I, I mean, I feel like Drake May is a better arm talent than Daniel Jones. But it's just when I start thinking about quarterbacks from the state of North Carolina, I start thinking about Mitch Trubisky and Daniel Jones. We're both very hyped up. And while Daniel Jones is certainly better than Mitch Trubisky, neither one really has lived up to their full potential. I, I, I really like Jaden Daniels. I, I think there is certainly something to be said there with him. And I see a pathway where Jaden Daniels ends up being the best quarterback out of this draft. As I've said before, I have doubts about Caleb Williams from a maturity aspect. He's got a strong arm. There's no doubt on that. And he's mobile, but we got to see what he can do also against real defense, because frankly, the Pac-12 defense is non-existent most of the time against an NFL defense. That's going to be a real challenge. A quarterback like a Jaden Daniels who played in the SEC this year faced a much better secondary all year long with LSU playing in that SEC West playing against teams like Bama and Auburn that constantly have top prospects in the secondary that go in the draft. Uh, Brett, how do you see this quarterback class this year? There, there's so many what ifs uh, with this class. I, I like what Ethan said before about prospect fatigue. I mean, you could even reference back to the 2021 class that we were talking about earlier. Fields and Lawrence were the one, two the whole year, pretty much. They were mocked one, two. And then he ended up falling to what? He fell to eight or like yeah, literally like just before the top 10 ended. And, and for what? For Zach Wilson because of one throw? And, and like, give me a break, man. Like, you know, the, but the thing about this class is like every quarterback in my mind here, even Caleb Williams is very boomer bust in my opinion. Now I I've watched Caleb Williams a few games. I, I think he's definitely clears everybody here. Uh, with that said, he's a USC quarterback. The only USC quarterback that's really done anything at the NFL level to a degree of success is Carson Palmer. That's it. Like the the track record's low. Now I understand, like you know, college stuff aside, you could say the same thing. Like, oh, like Ohio State hasn't had many good quarterbacks. Look at C.J. Stroud did in his first year. He's maybe defying the logic of okay, these schools don't produce good quarterbacks. Could that happen with Caleb Williams? Sure. I mean, the Bears are pretty much locked to pick him at number one at this point. They have Keenan Allen, Cole Komet, and D.J. Moore to work with. That is a great. Uh, great offense to work around. I mean, they signed DeAndre Swift to a contract and he can catch passes out of the backfield for him. So for any rookie quarterback, it's really about where you end up. Um, I, I, I like, I like Jalen Daniels, Jaden Daniels, excuse me as well, but here's the thing, you know, with the older quarterback prospects, you truly just never know. Now he's had five, six years in college, right? He could be the most polished. He, he, he also could be Brandon Whedon where all that time in college doesn't do you any good. And by the time you get to the NFL, you can't adjust to a pro level defense. So you, I, I honestly don't really know Drake may. I, I like his arm. I, I like his physical intangibles. I, I think he's definitely the second best quarterback in this class. And like all of you, I don't really understand the JJ McCarthy hype. That team never passed the ball at all. And when they did, sure. He made a couple of tight contested throws and he had good accuracy, but there's not much film to go off of. So he's a big, what if, 
Yeah, it's like with J.J. McCarthy, I see A.J. McCarron. I mean, I don't really get it. He seems like someone who was really the product of a system. And while he made some big plays down the stretch in the college football playoff, he was behind a top 5-0 line in the country. He had two elite running backs on that team, and he had some good receivers, and a lot of Michigan success hinged on their defense. So all of that together, to me, it's apparent that J.J. McCarthy is not a serious prospect, but for some reason he is, and he just keeps on rising. The benefit for him as well is that like you, you documented in your most recent mock draft, Ethan, out of those top five teams, four of them absolutely need a quarterback. Obviously, the Bears are taking one. The Commanders, I don't see a world where they're sticking with Marcus Mariota all year. The Patriots trading away Mac Jones obviously have a spot. And the Vikings, Kirk Cousins leaves. They need a quarterback. So all four of those teams, 100%, are going to be looking in the QB market. And I mean, I guess J.J. McCarthy might be the fourth best quarterback. I think you can make the argument about Michael Penix in that conversation as well. But not surprised to see all four of those teams be in the market for a quarterback. But let's go to the number six pick because, Tim, the Giants are in an interesting spot here because you lose Saquon Barkley in free agency. You've drafted offensive linemen early a couple of times. And right now, I think the O-line is in a pretty good spot. This is the receiver draft, as you mentioned, and you were high on Marvin Harrison Jr. I think a lot of other people are, too, and for that reason, he probably won't be available at number six. Uh, if he is, I think that's the clear-cut answer for the Giants, but uh, between Adunze and Malik Neighbors, if it's between those two, who do you think the Giants should get, or do they pivot to another position? You know, I've really had to think about this because, again, for me, the production you've seen from Malik Neighbors is remarkable. The thing that in a Brian Dable offense that I can fantasize with is the fact that you get a guy like Jalen Hyatt who could take the top off of defenses, and you get a guy like Neighbors who's even faster than Jalen Hyatt who can also do the same thing and maybe do a little bit more in the short game. But when I look at a guy like Adunze, and this is another reason why, and I didn't mention him at the start, I truthfully see a lot of Devontae Adams and Adunze. He can take the tops off of defense as well, but he's a really good, gifted physical route runner that can make a lot of great plays. And it, it's hard to say because, again, I, I feel that the style of offense the Giants play, it's not as going to be as fitting for Adunze as it would be neighbors. But I think when it's all said and done for the Giants, what you need to go with is that you made this investment in Daniel Jones. And again, I know a lot of people want to see him draft a quarterback, and I get that. I'm not saying Daniel Jones is the answer. Listen, he's not healthy. I do believe, though, he could still be a quality quarterback in the NFL. But you need to let time play out and give an investment to this team. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. The Giants' best receiver in the last six seasons – has been Darius Slate. Darius Slate has had a 1,000-yard season. He's been the Giants' most consistent receiver. Penny Galladay didn't work out, but you can change your, your your whole direction by getting a playmaker. And Malik Neighbors, in my opinion, if Marvin, Ayers, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. isn't available, which he should not be by the time he gets to the sixth pick, I, I would go with that. But I'll also say this too, Eddie. If the Giants opt to trade back, let's say if it's the pick 10, whatever it is, then yes, if they still get a receiver and they're doing it just like what they did, granted, I wasn't a big fan of the Canarius Tony, uh, you know, draft, but it made sense for the Giants to trade back. If that is the scenario, listen, I'm all for that if it develops something in the long term. But for the Giants at the start of this draft, you've got to get the position that's going to make the most change. And in my utter opinion, because of the fact the Giants aren't drafting first, second, third in that top three, quarterback is not going to be that case. I think you can get a much better valued quarterback later in the first round, maybe even trade up as Joe Shane has been very, very adamant on about doing about maybe getting Penix in a late first, but you got to go Malik neighbors if he's available um, in my opinion, and less the options to trade back into the top uh, later in the top. That mock draft has the number six pick going to Malik neighbors Number seven, though, Ethan, you've got Brock Bowers. And, you know, this is just two years removed from the Falcons taking Kyle Pitts. Last time a tight end had a lot of high draft prospects in that 
has not worked out for one reason or another, but maybe you blame a little more on the coaching scheme of Arthur Smith than the player itself. Uh, talk to me through the logic of having Brock Bowers as a top 10 draft pick. And I know you've been high on him as one of the best prospects in this draft. It is so hard because that dude is such a good football player, but he's so hard to place. You know, I don't know. I could see him going early as five, but then I could also see him going like fallen maybe to the twenties, just based on positional value. I think the Pitts comparison is kind of weak. Like Pitts is more of a receiver tight end while Bowers can catch the ball. I feel like he is not the same speed and style as Pitts. He's more tough to run you over. Um, I think the Titans could use somebody like that. They have a whole new regime. They're trying to flip everything around. They were so run heavy the past forever with Mike Vrabel. I think they want to start throwing the ball more uh, with Callahan. I think Bowers does that. If you're at seven, I've heard – I would go with Dunze. I've heard they're not big fans of Dunze for whatever reason. I figure the next best pass, pass catcher behind Dunze would be Bowers. So let's go, Brett, over to the 10th overall pick because I see the jersey you're wearing, the New York Jets, who uh, 2024, I guess, has to be the year. It's year two of Aaron Rodgers, who – uh, only played four snaps last season. Didn't end up getting named as the VP nominee for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. So he is still a quarterback in the New York Jets. Still has not completed a pass as a member of the New York Jets. And he's 40 years old. Uh, I think the easy call here for the Jets is to look for an offensive lineman because I think Aaron Rodgers has the weapons he needs because it was very apparent between Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson's production last year, even with a subpar O-line and nothing at quarterback, they were still able to produce at a high level. Um, Ethan's got Talise Fuagua from Oregon State as the number 10 pick, a tackle going to the Jets. Uh, who are you pinpointing as a Jets fan that you'd like to see at Gangreen with the number 10 pick? I mean, listen, there, there's three guys that I'd be okay with, right? I obviously, like, if Joe Alt miraculously falls, which he won't, but if he miraculously falls at 10, I think that's a no-brainer. Um, Tylee Sufango would be an excellent pick as well. I think he's a fantastic prospect. And it's like you said, Eddie, I mean, both of the Jets starting offense tackles are 33 years old. You got Morgan Moses on the right, who's a more durable version, but he's still a stopgap. And Tyron Smith, who, when's the last time dude played a full season, if he even has in his career, right? So you need insurance behind him. I, I love Max Mitchell to death. I love Carter Warren too, but they're not starting caliber players at this stage of their career yet. Um, so you definitely need somebody behind them that could step in. And that's where I think like one of these tackle prospects should be selected if they're on the board. Now, with that being said, I, I also do like Brock Bowers. He reminds me of like a speedier Mark Andrews um, in, in a way, because he's he, he they Georgia utilized them in the tight end screen sets. Uh, a lot of their plays to him as well were over the middle of the field. He's shown that he's more than capable as a receiving option. He's a pretty, he's a decent blocker in the run game. I mean, that definitely needs work, but that's still something where I think he can contribute over Tyler Conklin in that regard in, in the first year. I, I, I'm still very high as a Jets fan on Jeremy Rucker. Do I think we really need a tight end at 10? No, I, I think Tyler Conklin and Rucker will do the trick, but a guy like Brock Bowers would never hurt. And I wouldn't be mad if the Jets picked him. I, I also love, I love Romo Dunze a lot. I, his tape is fantastic. He's got a, He's got a, a lot of routes in his route tree. He's tall, six foot three, 212 inch arms, very physical. Uh, in a way, he's kind of like the guy we signed to a one-year deal earlier earlier in the offseason, right? Mike Williams. That's been his most common pro comp. I, I completely agree. Um, he, he's got that same speed as well, where he's not just like a one-trick pony and you're just gonna throw it to him in the red zone. He he'll be able to make plays all over the field. And I I'll even go as far to say as like, you know, he has a chance to challenge Marvin Harrison Jr. as the best receiver in this class. Do I think that'll happen? I don't know. I, I Marvin Harrison Jr. is the most hyped wide, wide receiver prospect in a long time and rightfully so. So he should like if he's going to go to Arizona, which is I don't see him falling past Arizona. If he does somehow, the Chargers are going to swoop him up because they're not going to let Quentin Johnston be a number one receiver. Give me a damn break. This isn't Madden. You know what I mean? So, um, like, with that being said, um, any of those three guys, I'd be okay with the Jets picking. 
And Joe Douglas so far, he, you know, he's been very hit or miss with his drafts, but I feel like he'll get this one correctly. The Jets have had a solid off season. This is our Super Bowl, So I, I, I just hope they pick one of those three because that is, to me, those are the obvious picks. Yeah. Now, Tim, you were very high a few minutes ago on Marvin Harrison Jr. going as far as saying that you think he's possibly a future Hall of Famer. I think he's really good. I got to see him play against Rutgers last year. That be, And he's an elite route runner. He's got great hands. But it almost reminds me a little bit of two years ago when there was that draft class with Devontae Smith and Jamar Chase and Jalen Waddell, where you had those three receivers that were all uh, highly touted top 10 prospects, much like we're seeing right now with Harrison Odunze and Neighbors. But I think what we learned over time, despite Jamar Chase's great rookie year and the hype around Devontae Smith because he did win a Heisman as a receiver that's so hard to do, was that there's just not as much separation between those three in terms of their skill level as some people might have been led on to believe going into that draft. And while I do believe Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best receiver of these three, I don't think the gap is that insurmountable, which is why I agree with Brett. There is definitely a high ceiling with neighbors and with Adunze that they could reach that level. And I mean, watching Roma Adunze play for Washington during the CFP, both against Texas and again in the natty against Michigan, it is very clear that kid is ready for the big stage. So while Marvin Harrison Jr. has the hype, he went to Ohio State, and of course he's got the name, Tim... I don't see him being that far above the other two and just in terms of maybe the potential, yeah, but in terms of the actual skill level right now, no. Well, in terms of preparation, the reason why I say that I truthfully think Marvin Harrison Jr. could be a sure about Hall of Famer is because, again, and I know we talk about legacy a lot in sports, but a lot of times when we talk about legacy of players coming to the NFL, more often than not, compared to their parents, they're not playing the same position, or if they are, they're not really as highly touted prospects. Marvin Harrison Jr. has stood out all the way from his start at Ohio State, showing his pure talent and athleticism. Now, I will say this about Dunze again real quick, because I think I can't undermine this. I'd like to remind you, I just compared him to Devontae Adams. And Devontae Adams is what? One of the top receivers in the NFL. If you were going back two, three years ago, you would argue is the best receiver in the NFL. I agree with you in that regard, right? There's not going to be a lot of the gap. But I still think that we could be potentially looking at two, three Hall of Fame wide receivers when it's all said and done, which again is why I keep on emphasizing. This is the strongest wide receiver class we've seen in a tiny bit. This class is the most potential to really turn it around. And I I don't want to go off track, Eddie, but there is one team that I just don't think anybody's really talked about that I really think has the toughest decision of anybody in this top 10 to make a decision in this draft. And in my opinion, that's the Atlanta Falcons. The Atlanta Falcons didn't bring back Bud Debris to this point. So you have to make the decision of, do you draft somebody like Dallas Turner, who also hasn't been really talked about much, to be that person at edge rusher. But when you look at what they've done this offseason, in my opinion, yes, they get Kirk Cousins, right? But when you look at that receiving core, let's be honest with ourselves. I mean, is it really anywhere close to what Kirk Cousins had in Minnesota? And granted, I get it's very hard to kind of turn around and really find yourself getting another Justin Jefferson. But for me, if I'm the Atlanta Falcons, Right. And and don't get me wrong. Drake London is a very good receiver and he's going to be a big, big part of this Falcons team, along with Kyle Pitts and, of course, Robinson as well as was very underutilized last year. But you have a potential for the Atlanta Falcons to not recreate exactly what they had with Matt Ryan and Julio Jones. But you have this potential to recreate a dominant offense with what already is a pretty solid stout defense. I'm just saying the Atlanta Falcons, if they go receiver in this draft, it I really do think they could be Super Bowl contenders and they could turn this team into a dominant, dominant threat, not just in the NFC South, but I think in the entirety of the NFC. Tim, I'm really glad you brought that up because, Ethan, you have Dallas Turner being drafted. And Tim, are you in like a tsunami there? Every time you finish. Yeah, it's hard to stop falling apart. Anyway. 
you've got them uh, picking Dallas Turner at eight. But I agree with Tim. While I know there's going to be possibly scrutiny from the fan base if they're like, hey, we have a high draft pick again and we're going for a skill position for the fourth consecutive year. There might be some people who are like, hey, let's not forget about the defense here. But the the Falcons defense is not that bad. I mean, it, it proved as a unit to be serviceable last year. And statistically, it shows that they were not terrible. And I think there are a couple games that really jump out where you'll see, oh, Atlanta allowed 40. But then they'll come back and that defensive unit kept them in multiple games last year when the offense, especially when Taylor Heineke was the quarterback, was doing nothing. And the defense at some points was keeping them afloat when Desmond Ritter was turning over the ball left and right. So while Dallas Turner definitely is a top 10 caliber player, Ethan, do you think, could you see the Falcons potentially pivoting and going receiver here if one of those top three hitters is on the board still at eight? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's certainly an option. Um, Tim might have a future as a car salesman because he might have just sold me on them taking a receiver. I love the idea of having a Dunze, London, Pitts, and Bijan. That's not just any Super Bowl contender. That's a young core group that those guys won't have to get paid for a good bit. I think Pitts probably will have to be paid, what, is that next year he'll get paid? Still, he hasn't produced much. How much is he really worth contract-wise? You could probably keep him for an average salary. And that that's a core group that will stay together probably four years. Kirk probably has four years left. He's probably playing the best ball he has right now. That That's not a bad idea. I do kind of like that. A dude's day to the Falcons. Now, something else you have in your mock draft with this whole wide receiver situation, because the Chargers are in an interesting position, as we alluded to. They're at five. I really feel like they're at bay of what the Arizona Cardinals do. And while the smart choice would be for the Cardinals to go Marvin Harrison at four, we've seen Arizona make some bad decisions many times before, particularly in the draft. So I wouldn't be shocked if they do that again and leave the Chargers waiting for Marvin Harrison. But you have a situation where the Chargers trade down and the Vikings trade up. What was your thought process on that? I think with the Chargers, Harbaugh loves building through the trenches. He loves that O-line. And he looks at those next teams behind them, and they probably won't take an O-lineman. So why not trade down a couple picks, maybe acquire a second or third, whatever they value for that pick. Quarterbacks are expensive, too. With the Vikings moving up for quarterback, they might throw in 23 in that whole deal. They could get a whole another first-round pick. Um I think they jump up back up from the Vikings original 11 pick and take Joe Alt, which is the guy who they would have took at five anyway. So they're acquiring picks for the same guy that they would have took at five. So let's pivot to some of the underrated prospects in this draft that maybe teams get hit on and, you know, it could be a flash for them. I'm going to start with a couple. One I already alluded to Michael Penix. I I at times have had doubts about him, but watching more and more film and particularly seeing what he was able to do down the stretch last year for Washington to get them to that national championship game. And also as a lefty who's an accurate ball thrower, which Tua is not, and it gives lefties like me a bad rap, uh, Penix is actually really good. And I would not be surprised if a team that's not necessarily looking quarterback drafts him second or third round, gets him as a backup, and then say there's an injury or say there's poor performance from their starter, he gets thrust in, and he seems like somebody who could really hold his own at the NFL level, which is why, you know, for the Giants, say they go receiver first round, Tim, I kind of like the idea maybe further down the line if Penix is sitting there and happens to be, because every year there's that one quarterback that always tumbles. And if the four teams that we expect draft those four prospects in Williams and McCarthy and May and Daniels and Penix is just sitting there. The Giants sweep him up middle of the draft. Suddenly, I think they have a much more viable backup option for Daniel Jones than they did with Ta- with Tommy DeVito, obviously, and Tyrod Taylor's gone. I think it leaves them in an interesting spot. How do you think Penix could potentially fit with that Giants offense? Yeah, I'm I'm all for it, to be honest with you. I'm really hoping the Giants do trade up late in this first round to go get Penix. Not because I think that he could be the future of the New York Giants, but there's the potential there of, A, getting a quarterback that 
produced very solidly in college. But B, I think the other thing as well to me is that you have to consider the age, the experience. I know a lot of times it doesn't exactly pan out. I know uh, before it was mentioned, for example, about guys like Brian Whedon, right? But I feel that you're getting somebody that's very matured with Penix, and I think that you're going to get somebody that could ultimately jump into the fire, handle the situation. And I think the big thing, too, because I know the Giants have Drew Locke. I don't really see Drew Locke being a Giant. I just can't imagine him starting games. I can't imagine him even being, you know, on this team past the preseason. I've never really bought into him. I never understood his hype. Like, to get somebody like Penix, I think would be huge. And again, the Giants, and it really fits Joe Shane's whole motto, to be honest with you. It's not, oh, we're going to get guys at their value, but we're going to be aggressive. And what I loved last season about the Giants especially, which I can't emphasize enough in last year's draft, right? It was a group decision on making their draft picks and how they traded up. For example, Brian Dable was the whole reason why the Giants got Jalen Hyatt last year. And while he didn't exactly fully pan out to what he wanted to be, the Giants were, for example, around before that patient on John Michael Schmitz. And what happened? They ended up drafting him anyways, being patient ultimately. So I really do think Joe Shane's going to be tactical. But yes, if they get Penix, I think that is a huge reliable option. And rather, if he's starting games or or, or coming off uh, the bench or, you know, replacing an injured Daniel Jones, I think he'll be a good fit for the New York Giants. The only thing you have to adapt for, right, is in terms of offenses, you go from righty, lefty. I truthfully don't know how hard that is to adapt, but we'll see. But I think he's going to be a great fit. Yeah, I really think so, too. I think Penix would be an excellent fit in that giant system. So he's one of my underrated guys. Another one that I really hope he drops to the Eagles is Cooper DeGene from Iowa, who if you watched Iowa football this year, they set offense back about 75 years. And Cooper mm-hmm. DeGene essentially was what kept that team afloat multiple games during the season where he was the guy. He had a couple of clutch interceptions. He can also return kicks. He's an incredible speedster. And at safety, you pair him uh, with Reed Blankenship potentially, you know, this Eagles secondary has had some problems these last couple of seasons, but I, I think Cooper DeGene, they got to go secondary in this first round this year. There are options. Kool-Aid McKinsey is a guy I like. Mike Sandra still from Michigan is another one that I'm a big time fan of that I, I hope gets picked by a good team in the first round because he was essentially the anchor of that Michigan defense, much like Cooper DeGene was just to another level at Iowa. And I know the one drawback a lot of people have about defensive backs from the Big Ten is that they didn't face that great of quarterbacks at times. But I'll make the argument with Cooper DeGene, he had the tough task of essentially carrying his team at times because there was nobody else there. And there was just so much pressure on that Iowa defense to allow 10 points or less because the offense couldn't score in double digits. So he is certainly battle tested and ready for the occasion. So to me, both him and Mike Stan were still underrated prospects in this draft, as well as Michael Penix. And I think any team that gets any of those three definitely are in for a treat. Uh, Brett, I'll go to you next. Some uh, underrated names that you're looking at in the draft, maybe for the Jets or maybe in general. You know, that, that, uh, honestly, that's an excellent question. But first and foremost, um, I, I wanted to reiterate the Michael Penix situation you were talking about because I, I, I really like him. I think if he falls in the right situation, he could be like one of the best quarterbacks in this entire draft. A situation, it's, it's like we always say, we say this every year with every quarterback prospect, situation is just so important for a quarterback's development. And, you know, for someone like Michael Penix, I mean, I'm a little biased. Like, if he falls in the third round, can the Jets please snag the guy as, like, a developmental prospect behind Rodgers and Tyrod Taylor? That'd be great. Because let's be real, I I don't think uh, generational draft boss Zach Wilson will be on this team in the beginning of the season. I don't care what Woody says. I mean, Woody Johnson's ridiculous. Like, he's tanking his trade value every time he speaks. But I, I, I don't think – that he'll be on the roster regardless. I mean, and let's be honest, unless the Jets, uh, unless the Jets front some of that money, they're like, or, or maybe even all of it for that matter, they're they're not gonna like nobody's gonna take him on. I mean, look at what Justin Fields got, like a sixth round pick. 
But one player that I looked at, I mean, we're we're, look, we're talking about offensive tackles, right, and offensive linemen. Like, one player doesn't get talked about a lot is J.C. Latham from Alabama. Um, Mox have him going everywhere. I mean, Mox have him going everywhere from the middle of the first round. Some have him going to the end. Some have him going to the Jets at number 10, being like the second guy off the board. I mean, I'm pretty sure at this point most mocks are unanimous that Joe Alt will be the first lineman off the board. But the second one has really been a matter of debate. And I like J.C. Latham a lot. He has great size. He's got great length. He's very quick on his feet. Uh, he, he, he'd be an ideal complimentary tackle in his rookie season with the potential to do even more uh, down the line as offensive linemen do typically take longer to develop. Now, one other guy that I feel like doesn't get talked about a lot is Chop Robinson, Penn State's edge rusher. I I, I love the guy a lot. Where where I think he's going to go, I, I mean, it, it really could be anywhere, but he's he is a presence. He is somebody that has an array of moves. You've, you've Great seen name, this too. Uh, g- great name. I mean, it's not as good as Kool Aid McKinstry. Oh. Kool Aid is the greatest first name I've ever heard in my life. Like nothing's Kool-Aid ever going to top that. Coach but... Kool Aid Han, that would be incredible. Oh, uh, that's what I'll name my son. I I I, I got you, buddy. Don't worry. But no, nah, but Chop Robinson is definitely someone I'm keeping an eye on as well. And I think you know, again, situations equally as important with edge rushers. And I think if he goes to the right situation, he'll be an excellent impact player from day one as well. Hoffman, I'm curious your thoughts on this, some of the underrated names, especially since you're a Browns fan and you're going to need to get a steal because I don't believe Cleveland picks to what, in like second round, like 54 or something? It's crazy. Yeah, it's late in the second. So, so who are some guys you're looking at? Yeah, for the Browns, I really like this dude. Uh, defensive interior Christian Boyd out of Northern Iowa. I know the comp isn't there, but if you watch his game film – he is a game wrecker. I think if this dude would have been playing at Alabama or LSU, he would be like Jalen Carter hype last year. I think he he's a top five level talent that's stuck in a small school. Um, it, it's unbelievable. Like there was one play where the running back ran left. He uh, got pushed to the right. He caught him all the way. I, it is This dude is insane. I, I've never seen a defensive guy, a lineman hit this big move like how he does another guy I like he's not as much of an underrated player as in he's being undervalued now Olufashanu last year if he would have entered he probably would have gone number three um this year he goes goes back to Penn State gets his degree kind of struggles in the middle of the season people have him falling out of the first round completely I can't see that I think he's OT1 Uh, I love his size his length he's a bowling ball tackle who can get downfield, he can uh, lock up a top-tier defensive end. Um, another guy I like, I like uh, Cooper Beebe for Kansas State, too. He's a sixth-round projected guy. I can't see that. He's a great guard. He, I, I think if he went anywhere, he'd be starting day one after training camp. Good stuff. Let's finish with this. Uh, Hoffman, of course, has his full mock draft. Uh, the three of us don't, but – Let's just go through the top 10 and give quick picks on uh, who we got going where. So we'll start number one overall, Chicago Bears. Ethan's got Caleb Williams. I got Caleb Williams. Tim and Brett, you also think Caleb Williams go number one? No doubt. Absolutely. No chance he doesn't. So let's go number two. So Hoffman's got the commanders drafting J.J. McCarthy. Again, I agree with him that this is not the right decision at all. But Washington doesn't know what they're doing, so I'm not surprised at all. And I agree. I, I I think based on what we've heard and based on just the way the commanders carry that franchise sometimes, they're going to be allured by the fact that this guy was a national champion. So J.J. McCarthy, I think, will go number two, even though he doesn't deserve it. Uh, Tim, Brett, who you got it to? Who, who does Joe Henry want here is my question. That's a good question. I, I really highly good doubt we're gonna have to ask him. I highly doubt he wants JJ McCarthy. I I because I, I just don't know. The commanders are really good at making bad decisions the last five years in the first round of the draft. To me, if it's not because again, I know we've also talked about Drake May, right? About how we can see him being the second best quarterback. But with the way the draft is playing out, to me, I know maybe the visit with Daniels wasn't the best for Washington. But 
I, you've got to take him at two. At, at least if you're not, if you're not going to drink me, you've got to go him at two. I just, again, I, I can't see J.J. McCarthy doing anything. But again, knowing the commanders, they'll probably draft J.J. McCarthy. Let's be honest. Brett, what do you think? Yeah, and, and going on what Tim just said, like, yeah, Jaden Daniels uh, uh, allegedly had a bad meeting with them. This is smokescreen season. You you don't know what's true and what's not until after the draft's over, maybe even a year or two in advance. I, I think the commanders are still enamored with Jaden Daniels and that he's the pick at two. Number three overall, Hoffman's got the Patriots going Drake May. I think they go Jaden Daniels. I, I really think Daniels slides up to number three. A lot of people have argued that he might be the second best prospect in this draft. I think that's a fair assessment to say in terms of the QB spot and potentially overall. So I say New England starts anew with Gerard Mayo as coach and Jaden Daniels as their QB one. Tim and Brett, where do the Pats go here at three? Their first draft pick without Bill Belichick calling the shots in a quarter century. And just to clarify, on the previous pick, I have Jaden Daniels at two. Just, again, could see them going McCarthy. But for me, I think right now, Drake May is the best spot I think they have at three. And again, for New England, it's it's a big time for transition. But I think Drake May is a good step in the right direction and most definitely an upgrade for Matt Jones. Brad, how about you? I completely agree with Tim. I mean, respectfully, if he goes to the Patriots, I hope he's a generational bust and that he does absolutely nothing with his career. But it's going to be Drake May, for sure. Let's go Cardinals at four. We all think um, Maserati Marv going to Arizona. I, 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 I'm I confident that they won't screw this one up, but again, you never know with this team. I, I would just like to remind you this, Eddie. There could have been an alternate scenario in this world where, where things worked out, where DeAndre Hopkins, Hollywood Brown, and Marvin Harrison Jr. could have all been on the same team. It didn't work out that way, of course. But as much of a train, uh, of a train wreck the Cardinals have been the last few seasons, I think Marvin Harrison Jr. gets them back in a step in the right direction, and they can start building towards producing a competent football team again. So I think he's got to go at number four. Brett, how about you? I agree. He, he He's the consensus. He's rated as the consensus best receiver in this draft. I, I don't think the Cardinals are going to pass that. Marvin Harrison Jr. and Kyler Murray pairing. So at five Chargers, Hoffman's got that aforementioned swap with the Vikings where the Vikings trade up to get Jaden Daniels. I think the Chargers keep the pick because if they trade down, they're not going to get their choice here between the two receivers. I really think this draft is going to go three QBs, then three receivers to start it off. Between Neighbors and Adunze, I think Harbaugh is going to go Malik Neighbors here. I, I think while I like Adunze and I like Neighbors, I think it's very even between the two. I think it's going to be Malik Neighbors going number five overall to Harbaugh. Though, of course, Harbaugh does have his ties with the West Coast, and maybe he'd like Adunze from Washington, but I think he's going to go with the LSU kid and Malik Neighbors, number five. Uh, Tim, who you got at five? I think the Minnesota Vikings, and I agree with Hoffman, have to trade up. Let's be honest. I mean, Sam Darnold is not going to be their quarterback of the future. They don't really have oh, What are you talking about? He will be. Oh, yeah. I mean, maybe 10 years. <laughs> you know, like, but, you know, listen, and I'm rooting for Sam Darnold to be successful. Don't get me wrong. I felt, you know, things didn't ultimately go the way as maybe it should have for him to get an opportunity in San Francisco. But to me, overall, they're kind of they kind of have their hands tied. And again, I don't have a lot of hype in J.J. McCarthy, but there's a reason why teams are talking about him up in the top five. So I feel the Vikings, they're going to trade up and they're going to make the bad decision of drafting the five. But you have to, you have to get desperate. Considering the kind of year they had last year and the quarterback they lost, that they're going to have to do something. So unless it's panics, which I'd be happy with if they drafted him the five, which would be an absolute reach. Don't get me wrong. But it, it, to me, I, I don't understand a J.J. McCarthy hype, but I feel they have to get desperate enough to do it. My only thought is, besides the Giants, I don't think there's any other team in that in-between area that's going to be looking for a quarterback. There's no way the Titans are drafting a quarterback the third straight year, and the Falcons just signed Kirk Cousins. So, And the Giants have much more glaring issues to solve in this draft than the QB situation. So I don't think there's as much incentive as 
to move up as some people think. Obviously, I think the Vikings are drafting a quarterback. I don't know if they're going to cost themselves any sort of capital to try to move up or if they'll just settle with who they get at nine. So we'll see. Uh, Brett, what do you see happening at five with the Chargers? Yeah, I'm going to be honest with the Vikings thing. I I don't see them making that drastic of a move to move up. I, I mean, is it possible? Of course, the draft is full of unpredictable narratives, but I just personally don't see it. I, I think for the Chargers, they, they need a receiver desperately after Keenan Allen and Mike Williams are cap casualties. I think Malik Neighbors is the better complement to Quentin Johnston, so I think he'll be the pick. All right, sixth overall, we've got the New York Giants. As I've said, for me, Harrison and Neighbors off the board. Giants get the other stout receiver on Roma Dunze. Uh, Hoffman's got them drafting Malik Neighbors. Tim and Brett, who's going to Big Blue? You see, Brett just brought up something interesting because, again, if the Chargers don't trade that pick and do go neighbors, I feel the Giants do have their hands tied and would have to draft a Dunes, which I would not be against at all. But based on what I'm seeing, I think that the Giants go with Malik Neighbors, continue to focus on that offense to try to take the tops off the defense. The Giants' offensive line re- are relatively settled. They don't have to really draft Joe out in this position. You can make a dispute maybe about a Dallas Turner, but it's way too early at this point. So I think the Giants' direction is clear, receiver, quarterback, in the first two picks, and you've got yourself a settled, pretty solid team to open up 2024. Right, how about you? Being that I had Malik Neighbors go in the pick before, and the Giants are also another team that I think are in desperate need of a receiver, I I think Romo Dunze is the uh, like the pick here for sure. I don't I don't see both receivers fall uh, all three receivers excuse me falling past six, so the Giants will swoop up the last of the big three. Number seven, the Tennessee Titans. I think because despite losing Derrick Henry, they do still have Tony Pollard. Now, at running back and the quarterback situation with Will Levis, they're going to want some protection. I don't see Brock Bowers going this high as Hoffman does. I've got it number seven. I think Joe Walt is the best offensive lineman in this draft. I think Tennessee goes right there and gets Alt off the board. Tim and Brett, what do you have at seven? I agree 100%. I think this is where Joe Alt has to go. And again, I mean, really for Tennessee, you've got to give yourself a full, full chance to develop that offense, especially with this being the first year without having somebody like Derrick Henry. So I, I think getting protection for your quarterback is the first step. And really, to be honest with you, it's been a little bit difficult since Taylor, uh, Taylor Juan has left uh, for the Titans, at least on the edge. So I think Joe Alt is a must, must go for Tennessee. And Brett, you. I 100% agree. Uh, the, the Titans desperately need some beef up front. So Joe Alt's going to be the pick here, and he's the best O-lineman in the class. Eighth overall, we discussed this at length, the Atlanta Falcons situation with if they go for a skill position player. In my particular case, all three of them are going to be off the board by this point. Neighbors and Odunze and Harrison all gone. So they're going to have to go with the best defensive player in this draft. Weird draft. No one on defense until the eighth pick. But I think Dallas Turner goes here from Bama and gets to play at the same spot where the SEC championship is played every year. Same thing that Hoffman said in his mock. Uh, Brett, I'll go to you on this one first. Who you got the Falcons taking at eight? Yeah, I, I also can see I, – I can 100% see Dallas Turner, uh, though they, they are in need of a second corner, so I can see them going for someone like Quinion Mitchell out of Toledo as well. But I think Dallas Turner is just – he's the best defensive player in this class – they're going to pick uh, value over need here, and Dallas Turner will be that pick. Tim? Yeah, you're, I was going to say, you're going to have to replace somebody like Bud Dupree. But my thing is, again, in my mock draft, at least for the moment, Odunze is still on the board, and I'm invested into getting a receiver for Atlanta and making this team a dominant offense. So if he's still on the board, uh, in, in terms of my pick, it's Odunze. Otherwise, if not, Dallas Turner is definitely the pick for Atlanta. All right, number nine, Minnesota Vikings. Here is where I see the pick being made for Drake May. I think May goes to the Minnesota Vikings here at number nine. I've already got McCarthy and Daniels gone. They'll go for the best quarterback in their minds, which is Drake May. So I've got May going ninth overall to the Minnesota Vikings, who do not trade up. Hoffman, of course, has the Chargers making a pick here and getting Joe Alt in this situation. Uh, Tim, who you got at nine? 
I have them getting Latham, I think, at this pick. I think they draft an offensive lineman. And again, protecting Justin Herbert, who took a lot of hits last season uh, and had to battle through a lot, the big thing. And of course, Joe Alt's already off the board. So to me, overall, for the Chargers, you drafted back, you get a little bit less of a value, and you still kind of get what you need. Offensive linemen don't really go off the board. I think it's a win-win for the Chargers. And again, I think the Chargers, even losing a lot of guys, Still have a sense of direction because they have a good head coach. So uh, overall, Chargers getting offensive linemen is not a loss at all. Considering again, this is a very receiver heavy draft, especially going into the second round. And Brett, like me, you don't see that trade happening. So who do the Vikings take at nine? See, it's tough because uh, as much as I love Sam Darnold, he is a stopgap. He's he's not a starter, like long term starter in the NFL at all. So can I see the Vikings instantly want to replace Kirk Cousins with J.J. McCarthy to hope that he can develop on the fly with Justin Jefferson and convince Jefferson to re-sign long-term? Sure. But I I, I also can see them beefing up the O-line. I, I, I think that's what they're going to do, to be honest. And Hufanga will be the pick here. It's going to piss me off as a Jets fan because it, it, it's like what happened with uh, – it's like what happened – who was it? It was DeWan Jones. Oh, no. It, who was it that got picked, like – Someone traded up the pick before as the Steelers. Who the hell was it? Like two last year or two years ago. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm blanking on the name. The point being, I feel like the Jets are going to get screwed a second time. The old lineman that they're looking at is going to get picked the pick before, and it's going to be Ufanga. All right. Well, let's finish with this the uh, New York Jets 10th overall pick. You got Salise Fonga as the 10th pick, Hoffman. I think he's still going to be on the board here at 10 for the Jets, so they'll be able to get him. Uh, Tim, who do the Jets take here? I think they got to go with Brock Bowers. I really do. Brock Bowers, when you compare it to all the other tight ends that really are dominant in the NFL and their college stats, Brock Bowers has this ability. And, you know, what what uh, Hoffman mentioned on the top of the show that I think is a real, real showing is that Brock Bowers, you know, he, he's a physical specimen and he can just run right through you. And, you know, the mix of not just the total yards. I mean, you, you mentioned Kyle Pitts a few seasons ago. He's put up better numbers than what Kyle Pitts did in a shorter amount of time. He, he's been more consistent. You even compared the numbers of guys like Travis Kelsey that we see now dominate the NFL. His numbers are better than his. Uh, you compared to Sam Laporta, who had a great season last year. His numbers are also better than his. So to me, overall, to say it like this, I think Brock Bowers is going to be something special. The Jets could finish their offense ultimately with something like this. And again, I understand protecting Aaron Rodgers after getting hurt last year. But if there's one thing Aaron Rodgers didn't have when he was in Green Bay, it was an urgency to get him weapons and targets. And while, yes, the Jets did go out in free agency and did go make trades to go get players the last two seasons for Aaron Rodgers, it's hard to turn away a talent like Brock Bowers that, to me, it shows that there's a potential for somebody to be a very special tight end. And I think that the Jets can also even use him in fullback scenarios, God forbid, if it were even to come down to that, because he is somebody that can be trustworthy on this offense and somebody reliable that the Jets desperately need. So, Brett, you missed out on your guy at, uh, that gets taken at nine. Who do the Jets take at ten? At this point, it's going to be Bowers. I, I mean, the Jets haven't had a tight end worthy of excitement since Dustin Keller back on the 2009-2010 playoff teams. I, I, I think that the Jets here will not pass up an opportunity to have a tight end that can easily, on day one, clear what Dustin Keller was for the Jets. And Aaron Rodgers will get another target over the middle to work with. Good stuff. As always, a lot to talk about with the NFL draft opening round uh, Thursday night as we find out who the next crop of rookies will be in the National Football League for the 2024 season. Thank you again to Ethan Hoffman for joining us. You can check him out on Twitter at Hoff23XI. Brett Hahn, host of Totally Goaded. Thanks to joining us as well. You can follow Totally Goaded and Motorsports Today, our other two things under the Sports Speak umbrella. Motorsports Today will have coverage from Dover Motor Speedway next weekend of NASCAR action, so you can check that out as well. And a reminder that we're always powered by SeatGeek, promo code SPORTSSPEAK, all caps, one word, $20 off your first purchase at checkout. But that's it for episode 171 of Sports Speak Live. I'm Eddie Kalegi. And I'm Tim Moore. Signing off, we will talk to you next week.